right, the feeling is mutual. Right.
Good morning. We're glad to see all of you in here, and uh, even though I can't see all of you out there watching online, uh, it's good that you can see us, and we're glad that all of you are taking part in this time of worship with Augusta Heights Baptist Church. I love that even on a dreary kind of rainy day as people are slowly coming in, I love like watching this place come to life and bring that light and that energy uh, into this place as you're greeting one another and talking with one another and hearing those conversations happening. So thank you for being here, uh, even on a drizzly, dreary summer's day. If you are a visitor with us, if this is maybe one of your first times being here, or if you just want to keep up with what's going on in the life of the church, get added to our weekly email list. There are visitors cards around in the pews. You can drop one of those in the offering plate later in the service as it comes around, and we would be happy to be of service, to be in touch, uh, to do whatever we can, to be of assistance in any way that we can, but mostly just to say thanks for being here, and we're glad that you are here. We're grateful to have Misha back with us after her world travels in Peru uh, for the fellowship that she was a part of, and um, hopefully she's getting over, uh, I didn't even realize this, but there's really not that much of a time difference. I kept asking her about jet lag, and she's like, I'm fine. <laughs> um, but glad to have you back with us, Misha. Um, we do miss Christine this morning, our associate pastor, who is uh, taking vacation, and a reminder that next Sunday is her last Sunday with us as our associate pastor. So we want to invite you to be here on Sunday morning uh, at 9.30 till about 10.15, We'll have kind of some light breakfast food, some coffee, um, and we'll just gather and mingle, and you'll have an opportunity to talk with her, um, to thank her for her ministry among us, um, to be a part of celebrating that as we will next Sunday. Uh, you also want to point out a few things that you will probably notice in your worship bulletin. One is that we've got a little change with the special music, so it says one song, we're going to do something different, because we just want to do something different. So uh, get ready for that, and I, I promise you it will be a treat. You'll also notice the prayer concerns that are printed in your bulletin there at the back. We want to continue to remember Lila Brockman, uh, an upcoming heart surgery at the end of the summer, and some consults before that. Um, Jeffrey Kellett, glad to see him here this morning, but upcoming uh, surgeries and procedures, keeping you in our prayers as well. Um, and I think the big one is September 15th, I believe, so um, keep that date in mind. And then John Kilpatrick, whose family has been fighting cancer on all fronts, it seems. Um, his mother, his father, his sister as well. Um, his dad started chemo this week, so please keep John and his family in your prayers as well. Uh, keep our third through fifth graders, or at least some of our third through fifth graders, in your prayers this week as uh, a group of them will be heading up to Camp Prism in Flat Rock, North Carolina, with a number of other churches from our area and even other states. Uh, that will be Tuesday through Friday. Uh, also pray for those of us who are going with them. And yes, I said us <laughs> who are going with them, uh, as I will be chaperoning some of that. Um, but looking forward to having a good time um, and a meaningful time together with them. And uh, unfortunately, we also need to pray for the family and friends of victims of another mass shooting um, that happened on a fourth, at a 4th of July parade in Illinois. And so we pray for those who loved a grandfather in a wheelchair, whose family had saved a choice spot for him, a mother and a wife who only recently mused to her family about where she might want her ashes scattered when the time came, to an uncle who went to work every day even in his late 80s, and a woman who was the go-to person for special events in her synagogue, and a husband of 50 years with 17 grandkids who would take his family out to breakfast every Sunday. And a suburban couple who took their toddler to see the parade. We hold them in our prayers and we grieve this loss of life and the other 200 others who have died in gun homicides since then. We grieve whatever made this shooter commit such a crime. We grieve the culture in which these kinds of shootings continue. And we offer not only our prayers, but hopefully our action and our lives as well to create a new reality. 
something more in line with the way of Jesus. So in this time of worship, may we hear and recommit ourselves to the call, to the way of justice and peace, to the way of Jesus. And as we begin in worship, I invite David and Deb Blondeau to come up who will lead us in our call to worship and our opening prayer. Blessed is God who speaks and tells us stories about ourselves. Blessed is God who reveals to us who we are and who we be. Blessed is God whose compassion is poured out on every person. Blessed is God who calls us to share that compassion, even with people we don't know or care about. So let us bless, worship, and follow God, and let us pray. Eternal God, rescuer of the weak, given every person every reason to judge us, you seek justice for us. You stand with the poor in the ditches where we have discarded them. You plant your word of truth in the one who gives us unexpected answers. Jesus Christ, word of truth, you will not pass us by, but stoop to lift us up and carry us out of our pain. You love the faithful enough to tell us stories which will shatter our complacency and send us forth to carry mercy to others. Holy Spirit, giver of mercy, you carry hope in your mouth and breathe it into our souls. You take us by the hand, leading us out of the ditches we have dug for ourselves into the brightly lit streets of the kingdom. Be with us, speak to us, transform us in this time of worship, we pray. Amen. Brian's ready. Let's stand and sing together. Uh, hymn number 395, God of Grace and God of Glory. We'll do the, verse, the first three verses. Let's sing.
seated and we'll invite children to come forward for our children's message with Miss Christie. Right? Anything special about it? Uh, no. no. Can I like wave it and it become a magic wand? No. No. Right? It's just an ordinary paintbrush, right? But it's so wonderful. Why would a paintbrush be wonderful? Linda? It helps to do stuff we like. It helps us to do amazing things, right? That we like. It helps us to create wonderful pieces of art, right? It can help us add wonderful color to our walls and our buildings. It can sometimes even help us add color to our outfits. Some of us have painted things on our shirts before. Oh my goodness. So paintbrush, just an ordinary paintbrush can help us do amazing things. Well, Pastor Greg is going to be talking about um, someone named Amos today. And Amos was just an ordinary man. He wasn't a leader of a church. He wasn't the leader of a country. He wasn't someone famous. He was just an ordinary man. But God called him to do an amazing thing. God called on him to spread the word of God and to love people and to love others. And so I want to think, I want you to think, are you the leader of some big country? No, are you a famous singer? Are you a famous artist? No, so you're just right. We are ordinary people, but we can do amazing things too. We can spread the word of God and we can love others just like Amos was called to do. Okay, so I want you to remember that when you come across just ordinary things, think about how that ordinary thing can bless others and how you, right now, you're pretty much just an ordinary person like me, right? Um, but we can do wonderful things for God. Okay, can you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today, and we thank you for these wonderful children who have come here to learn more about you. And we just pray, Lord, that you'll protect us, that you'll keep us safe. We pray, Lord, that you will help us to remember that you love us and that you have called us to be wonderful, amazing people to others and to spread your word. It's in Jesus' name that we pray.
stand and your turn to sing now with our next hymn, uh, our second hymn, number 604, Come All Christians Be Committed, and we're doing verses, help me out here, one and four, thank you, (laughs) verses one and four, let's stand and sing together. with me on the sign language, not as familiar with it as Christine. And while we're saying thanks, thanks to Christy for not covering me in band-aids that I had to peel off of my arm hair like my wife did to me last week during the children's sermon. Much appreciated. Our scripture this morning uh, comes from the book of Amos, one of the so-called minor prophets as we continue our major series on prophets. So hear these words from chapter 7 from Amos' prophecy. This is what the Lord showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. 
Then the Lord said, See, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam will die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go. Flee away to the land of Judah, earn your bread there, and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel. For it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amos was no seasoned pastor or famous preacher, and it wasn't a seasoned pastor or a famous preacher that delivered one of the most memorable sermons on a passage from the prophets. It was a seminary student. Now, she had translated the Hebrew, she combed through the commentaries, she'd researched the social and historical context of the passage, she considered the implications for today's world, and when she shared all of what she discovered in her sermon, she concluded, and that is why this text ruins my day. It certainly ruined King Jeroboam's and his top religious advisor, Amaziah, They didn't want to hear what Amos had to say. They could not bear it. Not in the kingdom of the country. It was a buzzkill to their comfort and complacency. Because in Israel, it was a time of unprecedented peace and prosperity. Unemployment was low. The stock market was up. Real estate was booming. I mean, a two-room house in Bethel was only staying on the market for a couple days. It always went over asking, and especially if it had the original hard dirt floors. <laughs> Life was good for some. But beneath that shiny surface, the society was sick. Political leaders were crooked and dishonest, protecting their own power and position instead of the people they were called to serve. The injustice system was corrupt, Those with privilege set it up to benefit themselves and people like them and handicap everyone else. Religion had become superficial, something people gave lip service and certainly not serving others. Empty rites and rituals while so much was not right in the world. Money was the end goal and the end all in business. There was no worrying for the well-being of workers, no concern for consumers either. They only cared about upping their profits. Weird sense of deja vu, sorry. And then Amos shows up, calling out the people and their political and religious leaders with this vision of a plumb line, right in the heart of the king's sanctuary, in the temple of the kingdom. Not God's sanctuary, not temple to God, but right in the midst of that place of power, with a vision of a plumb line. Now, with our laser levels and computed measurements, we're probably not as familiar with a plumb line, also called a plumb bob, which sounds to me more like a redneck fruit seller. (laughs) Oh, plumb bob, he's got the best deals in town. But that's what my grandfather called it, who worked in construction, probably because of the Latin root, and I'm not making this part up, plumbum, which is the word for lead, which is often the metal used for the weight at the end of a line, the bob of the plumb bob. And that's really all that a plumb line or a plumb bob is. It's a weight suspended from a string, centered over a mark in the ground or in the floor to be used as a vertical reference. 
letting gravity give them a true vertical line, especially when building taller structures like walls or tall buildings. In fact, a lot of ancient cathedrals still have brass marks in their floors signifying the very center of the structure above it, showing that a plumb line was used to construct it to be sure that that building, that holy space, would stand and last, that they were in line, that they were right, that they were true. Like Amos's message, even. A plumb line, a reference point, showing that the way of life in Israel, the idolatry of money and power, violence and exploitation, the injustices, the inequities, the indifference that was ever present is not true to God's intended purposes. It's not right. It can't last. It won't last. Like a wall that is not built true to vertical, it will eventually collapse under its own weight. You see, they say that the land can't bear these words of Amos, but Amos is not threatening them with destruction and ruin. He's simply telling them the truth of what will happen. Calling them to bring their lives into line with God's purposes, to set their world right with God's righteousness. And clearly, Jeroboam and Amaziah, the political and religious powers that be, well, they don't really appreciate that message. Because they like the way things are. I remember in Game of Thrones, Tyrion Lannister had a great line that said, it's easy to confuse the way things are with the way things should be when the way things are have always worked out for you. They don't like Amos' message. They don't like Amos. Get out of here, they say. Go away. Go back home. Where do you even get off telling us this stuff? Who do you think you are? To which Amos says, Nobody. I'm not a prophet. I'm not a prophet's son. He's not a religious professional. He's just a good old boy from down south in Tekoa. That's Tekoa in Judah, not Tekoa in Georgia. He's a sheep farmer who does some tree work on the side. He's just a regular guy. But he is a person who is willing and able to look and listen for what God is up to, what God is doing, and then to speak that truth even to those in power, even to those who don't really want to hear it. He heard that call to bring his life and hopefully his world in line with God's loving justice, and he responded. That's it. The only authority Amos has is his authenticity to himself, and to God. Which actually is in line with Jesus. With Jesus, people were amazed at what he taught and spoke, what he did, not like the Pharisees and the scribes, people with pedigrees and in positions of power, but still they said he teaches as one with authority. Because he stayed true to who he was, to God, to who he was called to be, to what he was there to do. In fact, the Greek word for authority, exousia, literally means out of one's being, out of one's self. Authentic authority comes when we act out of a sense of who we are at our very core. And for us people of faith, that means as beloved children of God and as followers of Jesus, acting out of who God created us to be and who Christ calls us to be. Brian Stevenson has that kind of authority in my mind. He visited Greenville a few months ago and shared about his call to the work that he does. Some of you were there. I see you nodding your heads. Just indulge me as I retell this story of his. See, Stevenson is a founder of the Equal Justice Initiative, which is an organization that's devoted to working for racial justice and criminal justice reform. He's the author of the best-selling book, Just Mercy. But in 1983, he was just a law student, working at an internship in Georgia and not at all prepared for what he would experience in the coming years. See, Brian had studied philosophy in college, not realizing until he was a senior, as he said, that nobody was going to pay him to philosophize. 
He frantically tried to figure out a way to continue his education to put off the real world, but found that most graduate programs require you to know something about that field of study in order to enroll in them, except law school, he found, which apparently requires you to know nothing. Sorry, Don. <laughs> and he found that he could study law at Harvard while getting a joint degree in public policy, which he was passionate about. He wanted to do this because he knew that whatever he would end up doing, it was going to have something to do with his life and his experience, with the lives of the poor, with racial inequality as a black man in the South, with the struggle for justice and equity in society, things that he'd already seen and experienced in his own life. But a year into that program, he'd grown disillusioned. The law courses were all heady and very disconnected from what he cared about. The policy courses were all quantitative. They only focused on maximizing benefits and minimizing costs. But everything came into focus for him after that first year when the law school offered a one-month intensive internship on race and poverty litigation. So he headed down to Georgia in Alabama, in the deep south where executions had once again resumed, and most of the people kept there on death row did not have lawyers. Just a few days in, Brian was sent by this organization he worked with to meet a prisoner that nobody else had had a chance to meet with quite yet. He'd been on death row for over two years. They didn't yet have a lawyer to take his case, but they sent Brian to convey a simple message to this man, that he would not be executed any time in the next year. And that was it. Brian, though, was panicked. He'd never been inside a maximum security prison, much less on death row. He was going there by himself with no professional to accompany him. He was inexperienced. He felt like he was in over his head. He had booked this visit for an hour, but he didn't think he could fill up 15 minutes with what he knew. And he was convinced that this man was going to be really disappointed to see him. So he gets there and he goes into the visitation room and the guard brings in a fairly young, neatly groomed black man who, as Brian said, looked familiar because he looked a lot like everybody he had grown up around. The man seemed as nervous as Brian as the guard removed the handcuffs and the shackles from around his ankles, after which the guard looked at Brian and said, one hour, and then walked out and slammed the metal door shut. Two men shook hands. They sat down. The other man spoke first. I'm Henry, he said. I'm so sorry, Brian blurted out. I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. I, I'm not a real lawyer. I, I'm just a law student. I, it's, it's an internship, and I, I don't really know. I, I'm sorry I can't tell you very much. I just, I don't know very much. And, of course, the man's getting worried, and he said, is everything okay with my case? Oh, yes, sir. Brian said, the lawyers at SPDC sent me down here to, to tell you that they don't, well, well, we don't have a lawyer for you yet, but, but you're not at risk of execution any time in the next year, and we're working on getting you a lawyer, a, a real lawyer. I, I'm not. I'm just a law student. I'm doing this internship. I, I'm happy to help if I can, if there's, and the guy cut him off by grabbing his hands and said, so I'm not going to be executed in the next year. No, Brian said. They said it would be at least a year before you got a date. And Henry just squeezed Brian's hands tighter and tighter and said, thank you, man, thank you. I mean, thank you. And he seemed to relax a little as he said, you're the first person in two years that I've met that's not another prisoner or a guard. I've talked to my wife on the phone, but I didn't want her to come visit or bring the kids to see me because I was afraid that I'd have an execution date coming up soon, and, and I didn't want them here like that. So now I can tell them that they can come and visit. Thank you. And as Brian relaxed, too, they started talking. Turns out they were exactly the same age, same birthday. They talked about life. They talked about music. They talked about sports. And it was only when Brian heard a loud bang on the metal door that he looked at his watch and realized he had been there for three hours. When the guard came in, he was angry. He said to Brian, you should have been done a long time ago. You need to leave. And he began shackling and handcuffing Henry behind his back and angry so that he put the handcuffs on too tight. And Brian saw Henry wince in pain. And so he said to the guard, 
I think those handcuffs are a little too tight. Could you please loosen them? I told you to leave. You don't tell me how to do my job, the guard said. And Brian could see Henry wince with each click of the chains being tightened around his waist. But Henry gave him a smile and said, don't worry, Brian. Don't, don't worry about this. Just come back and see me. Okay? The guard started pushing Henry towards the door. And Brian was just mumbling, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm really, I'm so sorry. And Henry said, don't worry about it. Just, just come back. Brian didn't like what he saw before him. He didn't like the way that Henry was being treated. He knew it wasn't right, but he didn't know what to do. The guard kept shoving Henry towards the door, but just before he could push him out, Henry planted his feet. And he tilted his head back, and he closed his eyes. Brian didn't know what he was doing until he opened his mouth and began to sing. With a baritone voice so strong and clear that it startled Brian and the guard, who stopped pushing as they heard, I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I am onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Brian recognized the hymn from the church that he had grown up in, but he hadn't heard it in years and certainly not like took the guard a moment to kind of recover and begin pushing Henry out of the door again. Henry almost stumbling as he waddled to keep from falling over, to keep his balance and all the handcuffs and shackles and chains, but he kept singing, and Brian heard him as he continued down the hall. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land a higher plane that I have found, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Brian was stunned. He had to sit down. And he later wrote, In that moment, Henry altered something in my understanding of human potential and redemption and hope. And Brian's understanding of himself who he was called to be and what he was called to do. That moment started a lifetime of work towards justice for all. That all of God's children should have equitable opportunity for life and liberty. And as he's worked toward that higher ground, he's held up a plumb line of sorts, seeking to level out the inequities in our society, to set right the injustices in our justice system, to hold up the idea of capital punishment in line with the image of God in all people and seeing that they are not square. Making sure that we are constructing a world that is equitable and fair, but even more so a world that is right and good by that divine standard and that those who live in it, in the words of Jesus, can have life and have it abundantly. It was a prophetic call that grew out of his own experience and authority that came from his own authenticity. So what are you being called to do? Because of who you are, because of your own life experience, how might you put your life in line with God's purposes and begin to set right all that is out of truth with God's promises, with God's truth revealed in Jesus. Not because of your education or your position or a title or an achievement, but simply because you're a beloved child of God, because you are a follower of Jesus. How might you speak the truth and act in that truth to bring your life and this world a little bit closer to God's vision for us? what it could be, of what it should be, of what it will be. I was mulling over questions like these shortly after I finished divinity school. Seminary will do that to you. As I was starting in my first church position, and it was around that time that one of my, being a religious nerd, heroes, Old Testament scholar and writer Walter Brueggemann, was going to be speaking in the upstate. His topic was the prophetic imagination. 
the call to imagine and to speak and enact God's reality and reign among us in contrast to the ways of our world, which is passing away, which, because they are not true, will not, cannot stand, will crumble under their own weight. And the church's role in all of that. So, you know, basically everything that I was trying to figure out for myself. So I went. He delivered an inspiring talk, even though he looks and kind of acts like a curmudgeonly old man. I mean, even in the talk, he sounded a little aggressive at times. Maybe he was just excited. I don't know. And I would have been more excited. I would have been more inspired had I not been serving a church that wasn't exactly enthusiastic about hearing that truth or answering that call. And I suppose my cynicism got the best of me when he opened the floor for questions, and those of you who know me will not be surprised that mine was the first hand that went up. But how do you actually do this, I asked, when so many people in so many churches don't want to hear it, when they don't want to be uncomfortable or challenged by the prophetic imagination? What are us pastors supposed to do? And maybe it was my tone of exasperation, or maybe he just had pity on a naive 26-year-old in his first pastoral position. But that curmudgeonly countenance shifted to something a little softer. And he said, you tell him the truth about what God is doing, about how this world cannot stand as it is and is passing away how God is bringing about an entirely different reality. You tell them the truth about what God is calling them to do. And then, if they'll let you, you walk with them as they try to figure all of that out and hopefully begin to live in that new reality as you help them live in that new reality. That is the work of a prophet, he said. Everybody was silent. Until after a beat, he went all curmudgeonly again and said, so you want to come back at me with anything else? I had no follow-up questions. That is the call, the work, We are God's prophets, called to tell the truth, to name the ways our world and our lives are not good, not in line with all that God would have us to be and to do, and to speak that truth, to enact that truth, and in doing so, to let our true selves shine through as God's beloved children and as Jesus' faithful followers. You may struggle with it. Others may struggle with it. People may not like it. Amaziah and Jeroboam certainly did not. People may say, by what authority do you say this? Who gave you the right to do this? Where do you get off? Who do you think you are? A child of God. A follower of Jesus. just as importantly, fully and faithfully yourself. Amen. You're with the 
made us to be, to be our true selves, the very self that God sees with all of our flaws and faults, but not to let that darkness overwhelm us, nor the sadness or the darkness we see in the world around us, but to speak into it, to act, to follow in the way of Jesus. And so we invite you to take the next step in that journey today. Whatever that might mean for you, to hear that prophetic call, to be the voice of God, the hands and the feet of God in your life and in our community and in our world. If you'd like to make a public response to that invitation, I'll be here at the front to welcome you and speak with you. Trust me, we would celebrate with you as we walk alongside one another in this life trying to make sense of our call and trying to hopefully make this world more in line, more true with what God would have it to be, with who God would have us to be. So again, if you'd like to make a public response, you can come forward as we sing our closing hymn, which is number 285, Wherever He Leads, I'll Go. We'll do verses 1, 2, and 4. Let's stand and sing together. Thank you.
you wish for or what you sing. Brian Stevenson, after several years in this work, had a chance to meet with some civil rights icons, including Rosa Parks. He met with them, watching them around a table talk and share memories, just trying to take it all in. But then one of them turned to him and said, so what do you do? He explained his work and Rosa Parks said, Brian, you're going to get tired, tired, tired. <laughs> and then she said, that's why you got to be brave, brave, brave. May we be brave to answer God's call to each of us. And we pray that God would give us the courage and the grace to answer that call. Grace never to sell ourselves short. Grace to risk something big or something good. Grace to remember that the world is too dangerous for anything but truth. And too small for anything but love. So may God take our minds and think through them. May God take our lips and speak through them. May God take our hands and work through them. And may God take our hearts and set them on fire this day, every day, and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace. Amen.